This is the second of two parts of this, this series of Scotland presentation. Last week was this amazing journey through history, starting with the Roman Empire and then through, uh, through many years up till the Reformation, in which Scott Parkinson, Dr. Scott Parkinson, uh, gave us the context of the Reformation, particularly how the Church of Scotland began. And then what he did, it was remarkable, he then took us back at each stop on our itinerary and showed how history intersected with those stops. So this week, we, we sort of pick up where we left off uh, with how, how change continued to happen, how history continues to impact communities and faith communities. And so how the Church of Scotland moved and became the Presbyterian Church after it was, you know, left the Scottish borders. So um, it is a privilege to welcome back Dr. Scott Parkinson, who teaches at Ball State University um, and is a member of our congregation. But Scott, right before I turn it over to you, I just, in case um, anyone has to leave in the midst of the presentation, I just wanted to give you a preview of coming attractions, something that we found out just this weekend about an event coming in April. The first Tuesday of April at 2.30, April 7th, the son of Dr. Millett, Dr. John Millett, is that right? Yes. Stephen Millett, he, class of 1969, he will be presenting through the McGuffey House and Museum Spring Program on April 7th. A program on Robert, Robert Hamilton Bishop and William Holmes McGuffey adapting the Scottish Enlightenment to the American frontier. 1803 to 1855. So we'll be sure to tell you more about that. So we have the day, April 7th, the time, 2.30. We, we don't know quite know where the place will be. But uh, this is a great opportunity for us to continue this journey and to partner with the McGuffey House and Museum. Mary Jane, I saw my hand back there. We the Art Museum. We go visit McGuffey Ghosts. It doesn't say where it's at. It will be. Probably. Oh, yeah. No, we might see if we can get Steve to bring it here. That's right. Uh, we might see if we can get Steve to bring it here. Oh. That's right. So, okay. so, so that's yeah. where I'm, I'm a bit uncertain about where it will be because when we received this invitation, I said, you're welcome to have it at the Seminary Church here in this space. So, I think part so, that can, yeah, yeah. So, so we'll see. Yeah. We'll, we'll have to see. But, and again, that's, that's how this learning journey continues. But for now, we return to Scotland. Uh, All right. Almost. Turn it over to, to, to Scott Parkinson. Will you help me give him a round of thanks? Thank you. Bridget to publish it on our um, news page of our website so you can get to the link there. So go to the church's website, go to the news page, find the link, she'll change it, and then you can look at it. And actually there's one other place where you'll be able to find it that way already. When you when you click the link, it'll go to the YouTube channel for the 2019 sermons. So I will post it to that playlist so you'll be able to find it in the 2019 playlist. We'll uh, get it out there so you can find it. Um, let you know for sure. I don't have this slide up there, but I have some information that I printed out just for my own benefit. And Helen Burke had mentioned after last week's presentation, she kind of understood the, the lineage better. Henry VIII, of course, King of England, until 1547. Henry is the house of Tudor. U-D-O-R, the House of Two. Of course, Henry married six times. Two of the six, of 
course, were executed. <laughs> Finally, had a son, Edward VI. Edward VI uh, was king of England for six years, uh, from when he was, I think, 16 until 22. Sickly boy, died young. When he died, the throne passed to his older stepsister, Mary I, bloody Mary. Mary was the one that tried to take England back to being a Catholic nation and got trouble. She also married Philip II of Spain, hoping that that union would bring Catholicism back to the shores. It didn't work either. When she died in 1558, thrown past to her younger stepsister, Elizabeth I. Elizabeth was the last of the two line. She died in 1603 without passing the lineage on. The Stuarts from Scotland, S-T-U-A-R-T-S, then picked up that mantle. And it was James IV, followed by James V, followed by Mary, Queen of Scots. James V of Scotland, this is the Scottish line. James V also became James I of England when Elizabeth I died. So it's confusing because you have the Jameses and, and all the other individuals. But that introduces the House of Stuart instead of the House of Tudor. James I of England, James VI of Scotland, was followed to the throne by Charles I. Charles I was the individual who was executed in England. That began the English Civil War. And then England became a commonwealth. Oliver Cromwell and his son Richard ruled briefly as the protectorate. And then the Stuart, Stuart dynasty was restored. Charles II was the king of Scotland. He's also the king of England. James II is a Catholic. He's also the king of England. There was concern about James's intentions for uh, England going back to being a Catholic nation. He had two daughters, Mary II and Anne. James II also became James VII of Scotland. So if you know anything about the Scottish history, uh, there's the James VII. Mary II married a Dutchman. William III of Orange, the Prince of Orange. <coughs> and this is where we get William and Mary. William and Mary introduces to what we call the Glorious Revolution, beginning in 1688. They come to the throne of England in 1689 because Mary was the daughter of James II. James II was pushed off the throne because of his Catholic leanings, and Anne or Mary comes to the throne ruling with her husband as king and queen. Upon Mary's death, we had already passed on. Mary died, and Anne becomes the king, or queen of England, 1702 to 1707. <coughs> she then becomes the queen of Great Britain, because 1707 is the union. And that's where England puts together Wales and Scotland and becomes the union of Great Britain. And so from 1707 to 1714, Anne is on the throne. And then the throne passed to George. George the first. The House of Hanover, it's a German house. And that brings the Georges in. George the first, George the second, and of course George the third. Everybody knows George the third, correct? George the third became king of England in 1760. And the first thing he had to deal with was those dang American colonists. Want to declare independence. And he remains on the throne until 1820. When George became the king of England, the House of Hanover, there was a movement, and we talked about it last week, the Jacobites, to bring the Stuart dynasty back to the throne of England and back to the throne of Scotland. And that's where Charles Edward Lewis Stuart, the body Prince Charlie, came in. And of course, the Jacobite rebellion ends. It fades. And England continues forward with the House of Hanover. So I printed that out. It, it helps me to kind of understand because even as an American historian, I don't always 
grasp all of that English stuff, European history. <laughs> Today we're going to look at three more questions, three big questions. We looked last week about where Christianity began in Scotland. Everybody hear me okay? I've been dealing with the cold, congestion. Um, last couple of nights have not been good. I've been up coughing pretty much all night long. Um, I told Pastor Lawrence, I think I'm all right. I, I, I sound worse than I feel. Um, so we'll see if we can get through this. But we're going to kind of focus on bringing that Church of Scotland, bringing the Presbyterian doctrine to America. And I have on the screen a picture. Around 1800, and I believe Tom Fay had mentioned earlier going out, so we could go down and eat. He said, um, is that what I think it is? And I said, yeah, it is. Everybody knows what that is. Well, it's in New Jersey. That's all. Okay. You've got the right institution. You've got Princeton. This is not Princeton University, though. University of New Jersey. No. It's Princeton Theological Center. Uh, it's Princeton Theological Center. Yeah. You're, you're in the right ball. So we'll talk about that in just a little bit. So how does the Church of Scotland become the Presbyterian Church? That's the first big question today. Then we're going to look at what were the forces, whether they're spiritual, political, or economic, that drove the Scots to the New World. Or as we're going to say a little bit, the Scots-Irish. And there's that Scotch-Irish, or Scots-Irish. Uh, as Dr. Barry correctly pointed out in church this morning, I thought he was going to be here, but anyway. He said, yeah, my ancestors, those hillbillies, he said. <laughs> so that's that was his, his uh, way of describing it. <laughs> and how did they influence higher education? These are questions that came from the information that Pastor Lawrence sent me back in the summer uh, when he asked me to do these two uh, presentations. I've been working on these, I wouldn't say like forever, but I've been working on them. I have other things I have to do, like put uh, lectures together for school, things like that, run trustees meetings, and do all of other things like that. We saw this last week, St. Giles Cathedral, the Highburg of Edinburgh. It's really the birthplace of the Presbyterian movement. John Knox, of course, begins preaching here in 1559. Here's the inside, of course, of the St. Giles. And we're going to see that on the trip to Scotland, those that are going on that trip. Knox, of course, is the founder of the Presbyterian Church of Scotland. The church's role in the Scottish Reformation and what we call the Covenanters Rebellion. We'll talk about the Covenanters today. It's basically this church is referred to as the Mother Church of World Presbyterianism. This is the Mother Church. Right? Today, of course, it houses an active congregation. It's one of Scotland's most popular visitor sites, among many others. Probably a million, I, I read online about a million people visit this per year. This church. Just imagine if a million people came to Oxford to see OBC. <laughs> what that would mean? What that would mean for OBC? <clears throat> Hopefully, you can read this. I put uh, some slides in here that they kind of describe and you can find some stuff. Presbyterianism is part of the Reformed, trust, uh, reformed tradition within Protestantism. Traces its origins back to Great Britain, particularly Scotland. We talked a little bit about that last week. They derive their name from the Presbyterian, small p, form of church government, governed by representative assemblies of elders. There are many of you in the audience that are either currently elders or have been elders in the church. A great number of Reformed churches are organized this way. The word Presbyterian, when you capitalize it, is often applied uniquely to churches that trace their roots to that church of Scotland, as well as several English and center groups that formed during that English Civil War that I just mentioned. Presbyterian theology typically emphasizes the sovereignty of God, the authority of the scriptures, and the necessity of grace and faith in Christ. Presbyterian church government 
was insured in Scotland by the Acts of Union 1707. That's where England, Wales, and Scotland came together. In fact, most Presbyterians found, should be found in England, can trace the Scottish connection, and the Presbyterian denomination was also taken to North America, mostly by the Scots and the Scots Irish immigrants. There's that act of union. Put it together. England, Wales, Scotland as what we now call Great Britain. And we're actually familiar with the British flag. And that's not the current British flag at the bottom. Because we've added the red stripes that have come across here because that comes from what? It comes from Ireland. Adding Ireland to the Mexican. But we take the Original flag of England, the flag of Scotland, you put those together and you get this, the original Union flag. And then when Ireland is added, you see the red on this white running through there as well. John Calvin, there's some books at the back table uh, on Calvin, those belong to Pastor Lawrence. Uh, so if you would like to look at those, we can talk to Pastor Lawrence. The other books come from the Ball State Library, so feel free to look at them. I mean, I haven't checked out for a year, but you know, they may call and say, hey, do that. <laughs> Reformed theology, John Cowan, Cowan and his immediate successors, that would include John Knox. Although there's a range of theological views within contemporary Presbyterians. As I hope to last week, I'm not a religious historian. I'm not an expert on Scottish history. Uh, I may be able to answer some of these questions, but I may not be able to go that deep into the theology. Local confirmations of churches with Jews and Presbyterian polity are governed by sessions. That's what we have, of course. Make up of representatives of the congregation elders. Uh, it's a conciliar approach, which is found in other levels of decision making, Presbyterian, Synod, and the General Assembly. So, you know, this is how it trickles down. The roots, of course, of Presbyterian, Presbyterianism lie in the Reformation of the 16th century, really going back to John Calvin. Republic of Geneva. I talked last week <coughs> sorry, about Martin Luther, 1517, the beginnings of the Protestant Reformation. John Calvin comes along a little bit late. Remember, Calvin was eight years old when Martin Luther tacked his 95 theses on the door at the church in Wittenberg. So John Calvin was familiar with what Martin Luther had talked about and preached about, but he wasn't really a contemporary <coughs> a second generation before. And of course, Knox is in Switzerland. He's studying there. He's familiar with John Calvin. And he takes that theology back to Scotland. And you can see what it says there. It's Presbyterians, some Presbyterians play an important role in the medical movement, sorry, including the World Council of Churches. Many Presbyterian denominations have found ways to work together with other Reformed denominations other traditions, especially in the rural community of Reformed churches. Now there are congregational churches. You kind of have to like separate this a little bit. Sometimes referred to as congregationalist churches, congregationalism. Are Protestant churches in the Reformed tradition practicing congregationalist church government in which each congregation independently and autonomously runs its own affairs. Now, if you know a little bit about American history, you know a little bit about Presbyterians in America, you know that at one point in time, there was the Puritans in New England. Those were the individuals that came to Plymouth, they came to Boston, they came to Salem. The main migration is in the 1630s. Harvard College was established in 1636 to basically train Puritan teachers and Puritan ministers. The Puritan church eventually just kind of disappears from the scene and is replaced by the Congregationalist church. As Americans moved westward, there was this concern that the Congregationalists would flood into places like Indiana and Ohio and upstate or the upper part of the Midwest. But the Presbyterians were coming in as well. 
And so they worked out this agreement where the Presbyterians were allowed to kind of continue their theology, their church movement in the Midwest, that you don't find the Congregationalists in the Midwest. So that's the kind of difference there between the Congregationalists and the Presbyterians. So these inner, these inner unions with other churches, such as the Congregationalists, yes, the Presbyterians and the Congregational, Congregationalists have entered into unions. The Lutherans, the Anglicans, that is the Church of England in America. Or what we call what? What is the Church of England in America? The Episcopalian Church. And Methodists. Presbyterians in the United States did largely from Scottish immigrants, Scots Irish immigrants, and also from New England Yankee communities that had originally been congregational. The change because of the Reed Plan of Union. This is the Plan of Union of 1801 for the frontier areas. The Congregationalists stepped back and they let the Presbyterians take off. We saw this last week the signing of the National Covenant in Scotland in the Greyfriars Churchyard. You're going to go to Greyfriars, you're going to see the churchyard. This is where the agreement was made to basically establish the Church of Scotland, 1638. There's Grey Friars Churchyard today. It is a burial, plain and simple. There is the National Covenant. That's in the Huntley House Museum in Edinburgh. Perhaps you get a chance to see that. That is believed to be the original, although there's some discussion about that. Now, what about the Covenanters? Maybe you've heard about these individuals. These are individuals that were basically opposed to what was going on in Scotland. They were opposed to taking the, the Church of Scotland in a Presbyterian uh, direction. They often incorporated the name continued the ideas and traditions in Scotland and internationally. They derive their name from the word covenant, meaning bond, legal document, the word agreement. And they reference the covenant between God and the Israelites in the Old Testament. They assume and receive the appellation of the centers on the count of the part which their forefathers acted the revolution in 1689. They openly and candidly descended from the public deeds of the nation's representatives to Scotland in both church and state, considering these deeds as involving a mournful departure from the from former bottle of the The epitaph old has ordinarily been a prefix to signify that they are of longer standing as a distinct body than any other denomination of Presbyterians who have separated from the established church. In some parts of the country, especially in Ireland, they have been called Covenanters. National Covenant of Scotland, the solemn league of the covenant of the three kingdoms. Religious, economic, political reasons throughout the 17th century, that would be uh, the 1600s. Scottish Presbyterians, including Covenanters, once again, uh, for religious, economic, political reasons, felt compelled to migrate again. So they leave Ireland, they come to North America. William Tennant, we're going to talk about William Tennant later, founder of the Law College, the first Presbyterian seminary in North America, came with his family to the Philadelphia area. They became known as members of the Reformed Presbyterian Church. They were one of the most vocal agitators for independence in Great Britain, and they volunteered in large number of soldiers in the Revolutionary Army. Covenanters were opposed to slavery, and in 1800, the Reformed Church voted to outlaw slave holding among its members. Now, what is the history of this structure in terms of congregation? The Seminary Church. Anyone? I know I said I wouldn't ask you a question, but I'm asking you a question. traces its history to Hopewell. Hopewell? Oh, well, South Carolina, South Carolina. Oh, well, up near Houston Woods, split off four churches. Morning Sun, Fair Haven, College Corner, and here. Is 
that mainstream Presbyterianism? No. Reformed, associate reformed Presbyterianism. I have to admit, yeah. Before you move on, not only did they outlaw slavery, they also forced slave owners to pay the slaves as if they had been. Yep. Working. That's what the problem was with those that left South Carolina and then came up north here. They, they had to move back, sell off their slaves, pay their slaves, and then we were allowed to move back. Yeah. I'll have to admit, there is coming in her blood in my lineage. I can trace the Parkinson lineage back. Parkinson was a covenant. Buried the very covenant of graveyard in Mary County, Michigan. They were covenant workers. I don't know what that means. I don't know if you've seen, seen the covenant of work. See some? All right. So why are they moving from Scotland to Ireland to what is called the Plantation of Ulster? That was a planned process to bring them to Ireland. James VI of Scotland, also James I of England, had land that he had confiscated from individuals living in Ireland. And so those individuals had had their land taken, the land was available, and he basically starts this movement of bringing them over from Scotland. And of course, as I said, they will come then to the New World. So what drives them from, this is the Ulster, this is Northern Ireland, and these are the, the three provinces, I guess, that make up part of Ireland, but that's all the Ulster district. This is where we're coming from, these Ulster districts. A couple of books about the Pres Ulster Presbyterians and the Scots Irish diaspora. The people with no name. Ireland's Ulster Scots married the Scots Irish immigration in the British and Atlantic world. Uh, Patrick Griffin is putting it in a larger context of the British Atlantic world. Uh, for those of us in early American history, uh, particularly those of us that studied under Dr. Caton in Atlantic, uh, he was working on the British Atlantic world. We read all kinds of stuff about that. 
couple more books, Scott's and Olson. You can actually use that to kind of trace the surname history. Uh, maybe that's where your family is from. Uh, the Ulster Scots came up to create the United States of America. They sailed from London there. <coughs> so why are they leaving the Ulster district? Well, Ulster becomes economically successful. And it becomes the most successful part economically of Ireland. And it begins to rival England. This concerned the British. They didn't want to be upstaged by the Ulster, Dist Ulster District of Ireland. And they wanted to control the economy, force the state sanctioned Anglican Protestant religion on these Presbyterians. And so it comes down to, to religion again. And so that's just why the pilgrims come and the, and the Puritans. While I said Puritans, really the pilgrims are a dissenting group of Puritans. We didn't realize that. But the pilgrims are a dissenting group within the larger Puritan movement. But these people are leaving Ulster because England steps in and says, look, we're going to push the Anglican religion back on them. And they said, that's it, we're done. We're going to go to the new world. And so between 1680 and 1750. This coincides with that period of time that the Americans are beginning to break away and think about declaring independence from Great Britain. So at, at that point in time, there's this influx. And you see it says 70,000. That's a rough estimate, 70,000. We're not sure how many came to North America. So the religious and economic life becomes more and more challenging for those living in Ulster. And the Scots decide it's time to pack their bags and move. So religious persecution, economic situation, and social deprivation are the main causes of bringing the Ulster Scots to North America. Five different ways. 1717, that's considered the first the beginning, went all the way down to 1775, right before the American colonists declared independence. So how many come to North America? We estimate about a quarter of a million. So when I went back here, it says 70,000. That's really, really low. We estimate about 250,000, maybe a little bit more than that. Scott? Yep. Sorry, just to clear yep. that, that quarter of a billion, is that from Ulster or from Ulster and Scott? It's a little bit of both. Yeah, it's a little bit of both. The main is from Ulster, the Ulster Scots. <coughs> 250,000. These are Scottish Presbyterians who had moved to Ulster from Scotland and now are leaving. Northern Ireland and coming across the Atlantic. The first passenger ship to set sail for America from the Ulster shores was a ship by the name of the Eagle Wing. It left the tiny port of Groomsport, headed to Boston. It didn't make it to Boston. They turned around and went back. But more will come. Why did they turn around? Why did they turn around? They decided they just didn't want to make that commitment. Those on board just decided they're not going to go. There were heavy storms. The ship was tossed about. And they decided that, you know what? Instead of causing more trauma and just setting off to the new world, they're just going to turn around, head back to Northern Ireland. And they did. 1636, they got back to Northern Ireland in November. The ship was damaged, the, the, the sails were torn, the main sail was in ribbons, the rudder was badly damaged. It was a miracle they made it, made it back. So that journey was aborted, but it was indeed remarkable that it takes place 16 years after the pilgrims landed at Plymouth Rock, if you believe that story. They didn't really land there. But there's a rock there, I've seen it. <laughs> Pil a pillared canopy over it. I've been on the recreated Mayflower. It's not 
there anymore if you're not a medical. Mayflower's gone right now. It's in rehabilitation. <coughs> You're rehabilitating, putting it back together, taking it apart, they're going to bring it back in the machine. That's what's on So, 1717, there were ships officially chartered to bring about 5,000 men and women and children to Pennsylvania. There had been a severe drought in Ulster. The crops had failed. And so they decide to head out, 1717, and come to Pennsylvania. And you say, why Pennsylvania? Why did they go to Pennsylvania? Now, they're really not on this map, because Pennsylvania would be right in here, there's the Delaware River. But you can see there's a colony, one becomes East Jersey, Nova Scotia, Darien, Georgia, and Stewartstown, Carolina. And of course, there's the failed uh, New Caledonia and Panama. These are the planned Scottish settlements uh, in the New World. But they come from Pennsylvania. Why Pennsylvania? What's so important about Pennsylvania? Freedom of religion. Freedom of religion in Pennsylvania. William Penn sets up a colony where you're free to practice the religion that you want to practice. And so Pennsylvania becomes this melting pot. Uh, in early American history, I always tell classes that if you want a true microcosm of early America, you look at Pennsylvania. You don't look at Virginia. You don't look at Massachusetts. Yes, you have the Pilgrims and the Puritans in Massachusetts. You have the Anglican slave owners in, in Virginia. But if you rather want to look at microcosm of early America, look at Pennsylvania. You have all kinds of individuals living there from all walks of life, all religious backgrounds. All social and economic backgrounds. It's a haven. And this is one of the reasons why they're attracted uh, to Pennsylvania. Now, I'm going to stop there for just a second. I want to get a drink and I'll see if there's any questions before we go. Give me a chance to kind of catch your breath. Andrew Kate. Kate Bell. Kate. Kate. K A Y T O N. Andrew Kate. He was my dissertation advisor. In the Quick. area where professors here to mm -hmm. to Alaska. Is Jamestown fit into this anyway? Is Jamestown? Yeah. Jamestown, of course, being the first permanent English settlement established in 1607. So it's a little bit ahead of Plymouth, a little bit ahead of Massachusetts. There were Presbyterians at Jamestown, but not to the extent where they're going to push their faith. The problem with Jamestown, Jamestown just didn't about make it, if you know the history of Jamestown. They landed there, and then they had problems right off the bat. At Jamestown, anybody been to Jamestown? Okay. Jamestown sits along the James River, where the waters from the Chesapeake and the Atlantic Ocean flow back up into the James, and they kind of mingle right there. Waters from the fresh water coming down the James mingles with the salt water. They established base camp right there along the James. And they knew that they couldn't really drink the water right out of the river. It's too salty. So they go and they dig wells, just yards within range of, of the shore. But what's going to happen over time? The water from the river is going to infiltrate into the ground, penetrate the ground, and get into the wells. And so what they were doing is they're slowly poisoning themselves to death by drinking salt water. Large quantities of salt water. And they had problems with the Native Americans. Native Americans didn't want them there. And so they had trouble with Jamestown. They just about didn't make it. It's just this influx. They just kept sending boatloads over there, hoping that they would eventually survive, and they do. But 1622, you know, half of the colonies wiped out by the Native American Army. And that's when the British government stepped in and said, look, if you can't run the show, we'll take the show. And it becomes a royal colony. But yeah, Jamestown figures into the story a little bit. All right. So here's the map of the Scottish colonies in North America. So here's Nova Scotia. It's very interesting to look. Here's the, the 
the land mass of Nova Scotia. If we took that same land mass and we put it over here, you can see that we're not talking about much area from both Northern Ireland or Scotland that make up Nova Scotia. Then it becomes this colony of Scottish settlements. This is the first documented Scottish settlement in North America. 1629. It was 1620 that the charter was given by James VI to Sir William Alexander to come to Nova Scotia and set up a colony. And so that's what they did. And then there's East Jersey. Sir Robert Barclay was given title to a deed of land. This is basically East Jersey right here. So this would be New York City, Long Island, uh, Manhattan Island coming down here, Staten Island. This is East Jersey. This is West Jersey. Here's Philadelphia right over here. Here's Camden. It's called Cooper's Fair. Newcastle. Newcastle is a settlement of Presbyterians. Newcastle sitting right there in the Delaware River. In Pennsylvania and East Jersey, of course, we have Quakers, Society of Friends, as we call them today. William Penn being a Quaker. So you have Quakers for the most part over here in West Jersey, and you have the Scottish settlers in East Jersey, led by Robert Barclay. 1683 is when the first Scots begins to arrive at Perth Town, what was called Perth Amboy, 1683. They spread then south down into Monmouth County and then begin to populate the rest of East Jersey. And then there is Stewart Town, South Carolina. Down these two, this map of both Carolinas. Carolina was one big colony in the beginning and then it was split out. But you can see there are pockets of Highland Scots. It's a little bit different than just the Scots. These are the Highland Scots coming from Scotland directly. Charlestown, Charlestown is pretty close to where this community was located. Stewartstown is just to the south of Charlestown. Here's just a map of South Carolina. You can see that our Scots Irish Presbyterians from Virginia came down Boonesboro Township. Swiss immigrants over here, there's different other French Huguenots. Um, the Hopewell people trace their roots back to Chester County. Chester County is right up in here. <coughs> Chester County. I can trace my roots back to Chester County as well. I don't think there was any connection with the Hopewell people, but they're all from Chester County. I do know that. It's a book about going from Ulster to Carolina. All types of things out there about this migration pattern. Here's Derry. Derry was in Panama. It was a failed um, settlement by Scots Irish Presbyterian stock uh, individuals. 1695. It just didn't work. And they failed. They lost a lot of money investing in this. Here's Derry in Georgia. It's down here to the south of Savannah. And you can read the marker there, roughly. James Oglethorpe. James Oglethorpe is the founder of Georgia. Does anybody know why Georgia was put there by the English? They put prisoners there to do what? What are they trying to protect? They're trying to protect Carolina. There's money in Carolina. Big money. Now, we're not talking about growing cotton. But along the coast, they're growing rice, they're growing indigo, which makes dye. So they're making money. And any time the British can get their hands on some money, they're going to protect it. And they want to protect Carolina from those living in what today is Florida. Who's in Florida? Native Americans and Spanish. So the Spanish and the Native Americans were realizing that if we just wait up here, we can get our hands on some of that money. And so the British stepped in and they gave James Oglethorpe, James Edward Oglethorpe, money and land to set up what we call Georgia. And as Tom correctly pointed out, they populated it with prisoners from England. They figured, hey, they can be a 
buffer to stop the raids on Carolina. Darian figures in that movie, Glory, you saw it on TV uh, the other day. Story of the 54th Massachusetts. Robert Shaw, the colonel, was wanting action. He said, I want my African American soldiers to see some action. And so they were attached to a white um, raiding party, really, that pillaged the town of Darren. So that kind of figures in. I just keep that in there for something extra. It's not a great part this week, but we'll throw the boy in there. So where do they end up? So you can see they're coming out of Northern Ireland, the Ulster District, Londonary, uh, Port Rush, Marne, Belfast, uh, Newry, and they're heading to Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Charleston. They're heading across uh, the Atlantic to the New World. In 1790, According to the Harvard Encyclopedia of American Ethnic Groups, there's about 400,000 U.S. residents that had Irish birth or ancestry. This would include those from the Ulster District. 1790, 400,000 from Ireland, Ulster, these would be the Ulster Scots, etc. It'd be hard to see some of the, the fine print. I tried to blow it up, but they've got worse. Just left it like it is. Cape Fear Highlanders, there's two groups really. You can see the green indicates those coming from Ulster. And the dates there are 1717 to 1775. Here's another group coming from Ireland in the Ulster district. But there's groups coming from Scotland itself, what we call the Highlanders. The Highlanders end up in the Highlands of North Carolina, the Highlands of South Carolina. They figure prominently in the American Revolution. When the British moved the operations of the American Revolution to the southern colony, they didn't realize what they were doing. And when they got down there, they realized they were going to put up a good fight. Because these Highland Scots fought to the last man. And at King's Mountain, uh, they showed the British really what they were made of. At King's Mountain, they really destroyed the British regiments at King's Mountain. This is what America looked like in 1740, 30 years prior to the American Revolution. From Georgia, all the way up the coast, all the way up to Maine, which is now at that point time part of Massachusetts. Broken down into three areas, New England, Middle, and Southern colonies. From Virginia and Maryland south, these are the Southern colonies. Middle Atlantic, right here, the Jerseys, Pennsylvania, Delaware, New York to some extent, and then of course New England. These maps come from my American history slides. I like these because they kind of give you an idea of what's going on. This is the Great Wagon Road from Augusta on up through the Appalachians to Philadelphia. And it kind of coincides with this right here, from Augusta on up. So once they landed in Pennsylvania, around Philadelphia, they could head west to Lancaster, down to York, past Gettysburg. And on down into the Appalachians, and on down into the Carolinas. There is Chester right there, Chester County, South Carolina, where the Oakwell Presbyterians left to come north of Oakwell. Scott, yeah. before you move on, yeah. head about, is it Watkins Ferry? There's, there's a darker line that goes to the northwest. I do? Yeah. Right. So could, could, could the Oakwell from South Carolina come up to Watkins area and head west, northwest? They could, but they probably more likely came from down in here. Yeah. They came up to Kentucky. Uh, through the Cumberland Gap and on up. Braddock's Road was built by the British in 1755. Washington, George Washington. And you can tell him from Central Illinois. It's, it's a Warsh. It's a Warsh. <laughs> Washington was sent west to dislodge the French at 
the fourth city of Ohio. But today is Pittsburgh. Right? I'm, I'm throwing in the Americans. So after Washington failed to dislodge the French, the British said, hey, he's 21 years old. He doesn't know anything about leading the military. And Washington was green. He was as green as they come as far as military leadership. So the British in 1755 sent about 2,500 regular British troops led by Edward Braddock. Braddock packs a road up through the wilderness heading towards Pittsburgh. He doesn't quite make it to Pittsburgh. He takes along George Washington as an aide, because Washington's always been there, already been in that area. He already knew what was going on. And so Braddock's men were ambushed on their way. Nancy Bay, this like right outside of Pittsburgh. It's on the old National Road, outside of Washington, Pennsylvania, on the old National Road, near Fort Necessity. Fort Necessity was Washington's surrender place in 1754. The French had him surrounded, and he surrendered. He signs a document that says, I'm surrendered. He was written in French. He couldn't read French. And he's saying, basically, I'm not to take up arms again against the French government. If I'm caught doing that, they can put me to death. And that was standard practice. So in 1755, he's there with Braddock, and Braddock's men are totally ambushed. I mean, he has 2,500 men, he loses close to 1,100. Because the French and the Native Americans pick him off. I mean, they're, they're cutting a path through the wilderness that's from the stairs to the walls. So, you know, maybe five guys across. And he's got 2,500 men, plus wagons, and they're cutting up through the wilderness. It's July. Everything's green. And the British, of course, have these nice red uniforms, white, you know, the trim and the brass buttons and everything. And so the Native Americans and the, and the French in the, in the woods on either side of the road, they're just waiting. It's a, it, it's a target. And so Braddock is, is shot. I don't know, he went down on like four or five horses. And he kept getting back on the horse because he figured, hey, I'm the leader, I have to buy a mount. And he got the very right of the boat. Didn't put a marker there because they're afraid the Native Americans would take up the body and desperate, which they would. Washington was present, but he escapes. And I always tell my students, this is a great story. Washington's frock coat. And a frock coat is basically goes over the military uniform. It's like the duster that the, the cattle wear on the frontier. Washington's frock coat was full of holes. And the question is, I always ask my students, why is his coat full of holes? Oh. Huh? Oh. Okay. <laughs> Some of them will say, well, maybe he was like being defiant and he was trying to show he's a tough guy. And he you know, flapped his coat out there and they shot at him and they just missed. You know, those muskets are not rifles, so it's just shooting them like a marble, and it's not very accurate. And I always say, well, those are great answers. But I said, what he's probably doing, he's probably figured out. Somebody's probably told him, you signed that surrender document. And if the French catch you now, you're as good as dead. So he was probably skedaddling out of there. And he's running through the woods, and the coats are flapping, and they're shooting down him, and they're missing. So if they get him, he's not on the quarter, he's not on the dollar wheel, there's no monument in Washington, we don't have a city named after him. Everybody forgets about him. <clears throat> but he survives. So. But yeah, I mean, it's kind of a long answer to your question, Pastor. I'm mm -hmm. proud of you. That's why it's there. But you can see where they end up. Scots, Irish, Circa 1775. So you can see the green areas of where we have the Scots Irish living as of 1775. Again, our map. And then this map. Population density. Everybody knows about population density. What we're talking about. This is population density as well. 40 and over per square mile. If you look at the population density map of Oxford today, this morning at 
the seminary would have a very big population density. Because we've got what? Three people here in this one little area. In fact, look around the neighborhood. Population density is high. Maybe not as high as the seminary because you know the apartment buildings around the building probably don't have 40 people living in each apartment. I don't think so. Either. But they might, it just depends. So that's what population density tells you. How packed the people are living amongst each other. You can see here, they first settle along what we call the Piedmont, and they move into the mountain regions. And they only move out as far as the Appalachians. The Appalachians are a barrier. And beyond the Appalachians, who's out there? What's keeping them from going farther west? Native Americans and their French allies. And that's why the French and Indian War, what we call the Seven Years War on a world scale, takes place. They're trying to control the Ohio River Valley. That was key. Now, so we go from this to this. Scots Irish in the light green, as you can see. That doesn't mean that's the only place to live. That's where we find a predominant number of them. Just from Scotland alone, we find the blue areas. We saw that if you go back a few maps. To here. This one, for the most part. Not all of those areas are Scots Irish, some are Scottish settlements, some are Swiss immigrants, French and German here, Swiss immigrants down here, etc. This is that wagon road. Again, Canada and Augusta goes on that mission up to Philadelphia. This is another map, just coded a little bit differently. And of course, you can see Africa. Of course, the first slaves were introduced in 1619 in Virginia. And that's where American slavery begins. We can break it down English, African, Scots, Irish, or Scotch, Irish, as well, or Scottish. You can see you can add those two together to get almost 14%, a little over 13%. And then where are they coming from in what years? Germany, Northern Ireland, Southern Ireland, Scotland. These are just from Scotland. And from 1760 to 1779, 25 pounds from just Scotland alone. I like this one. There you can see the pockets of the Presbyterians. Up in the Easters area, down through the Delaware River Valley, out into the Middle port points of Pennsylvania, around Lancaster in that area, down into Virginia, down into the Carolinas, particularly South Carolina. You see the Lutherans, the pockets, you see the Congregationalists up here, you see the Anglicans pretty much everywhere else. And then there's the Baptists, the Roman Catholics, the Jews, etc. Reformed churches, Dutch, German, French, Quaker, in various places. So there's a lot going on in this slide. A lot going on. I like this slide as well. And you can see it on there. 1700, 76 years before independence, 28 Presbyterian churches in North America, in the American colonies. By 1740, there's 160. By 1780, there's 495. Second only to the Congregational. So you can see from 1700 to 1780, that 80 year span, the number of Scots, Irish, Ulster Scots, Presbyterians that come to America, and it's reflected on that chart. The, congregate, the number of congregations just explodes. And it's not just them, it's the Lutherans as well, it's the German Reform, the Dutch Reform, the Catholics. The Catholics grow, but not like everybody else. The Anglican churches, 111 to 406. The Baptists from 33 to 457. So this kind of gives you that idea of what's going on. So where do we get that term, Scots, Irish, Scottish Americans? They're descendants of the Ulster Scots, those communities that emphasize and celebrate a common heritage. They originally came from the lowland Scotland area, the northern England area. Over the Ulster province, and then eventually 
eventually you can fall into North America. The book on the, on the left is back there, I believe, on the, on the table. That one might affect the show, I can't remember. Here's a little one about the music. They just did that PBS uh, series with Ken Burns about country music. And you can see it's called Bay's Area Strangers. It's the forward by Dolly Parton. Talking about bringing the music from that region to the new world. Francis Mack. Did I know where that statue is located? That's the one's going to answer. Because I know who knows. Just reading. Oh, they put it there. I did have one up there and I was going to fly it. Yeah, that's in Pennsylvania and in Philadelphia. There are six of those big statues. They're oversized statues. I couldn't get in the day I went there. It was a little disappointing. There's a sign on the door closed. And they didn't say, oh, they're closed. They said, closed. I'm like, well, I'm not here today. I wanted to see this. <laughs> anyway, I saw the statues. Uh, they were on the Witherspoon building in downtown Philadelphia. And when they were going to destroy that building, they took the statues off and put them there. The six that are there, including Matt, represent kind of the heritage of the Presbyterian movement in the United States. Maccabee. Maccabee is kind of the one that kind of starts it all. He immigrates in 1683, was a Presbyterian pastor from Northern Ireland. He sets up an early American, he sets up an early American church. He's considered the father of American Presbyterianism. Just like John Knox is the father of the Scottish Presbyterian movement. Matthew is the father of the American Presbyterian movement. He and James Logan, here's Matthew on a Irish stamp, and you see they, they even say, father of American Presbyterianism. Another statue of him. This is his congregation, church, if you will, in Maryland. Real both. There's room like that translates. Here's James Logan. James Logan is an aristocratic and bureaucratic Quaker, also from Northern Ireland. He's secretary to Governor William Penn of Pennsylvania. Come over, he came over with that first wave of Ulster immigrants to the New World. So Maccabee and Logan are kind of the first Presbyterians to arrive in the American colonies. Are they the first? No, they are not. There is Jamestown. This goes back to Tom's question about Jamestown. Here is Robert Hunt, chaplain at Jamestown. He's not alone. It seems that the Church of England chaplains appointed by the London Company were Presbyterians. They probably couldn't find enough Anglican or Church of England pastors, so they appoint Presbyterian pastors. And here's William Tennant. Born in Scotland, seven, or 1673. Graduated from the University of Edinburgh, 1695. Ordained in the Church of Ireland, 1706. Came to the 13 colonies in 1718. Came to Pennsylvania. He came at the urging of his wife's cousin, who was James Logan. Logan, of course, being an Irish Quaker, close friend of William Penn's, etc. And so here comes William Penn. Tennant is the one that sets up what we call the Long College. 1727. Religious school in a log cabin to the north of what is today Philadelphia. He filled his pupils with evangelical zeal, and a number became revivalist, revivalist preachers in the First Great Awakening. Now, I'm not going to go on into the First Great Awakening. That probably will be talked about when um, Professor Millett talks about uh, the Guffey Bishop and bringing it to the frontier. But the law college eventually morphed into, here's Tennant's grave in Bucks County. The law college eventually morphed into what is called the College of New Jersey. And that, of course, becomes Princeton. Princeton University eventually. 
And then there's John Wilson. John Wilson was the president of Princeton, the only clergyman and only college president that signed the Declaration of Independence. And there's his name right there. Graduate of the University of Edinburgh, gained a reputation in the Church of Scotland, leader of the left-wing popular party, his works being well known in American colonies, the trustees of the College of New Jersey, first elected in president in 1766. He actually declined that call to serve and eventually arrived at Princeton in 1768 with his, 1768, yeah, with his wife, five children, and 300 votes for the college library. 300 votes. The students welcomed him by illuminating Nassau Hall with a lighted tallow dip in each window. Now, he was warmly received, but he soon found a number of disturbing conditions in the college. Many students were inadequately prepared for college. The enrollment from the southern colonies had declined, and the most worrisome of all, the college's finances were in a sorry state. Now, if you think about that, think about these institutions today, things like places like Harvard and Yale and Princeton. You know, they start out scraping the barrel for money. And now, of course, they're the elite of the elite group. Witherspoon then began a series of highly successful trips throughout the colonies to preach, recruit students, gather funds. I mean, this was done all over the place, not just, you know, in this part of the world. While traveling through Virginia, he encouraged the Madisons of Montpelier to enroll their son, James, who later graduated in the class of 1771, fourth president of the United States, James Madison. He later persuaded his friend, George Washington, Witherspoon's friend, George Washington, there he is, Washington, to give 50 gold guineas. That's a lot of money. To the college, Washington was a long-time advocate of Princeton. He said at one point, no college has turned out better scholars or more esteemable characters than Nassau. Talk about Princeton. Witherspoon called the college pastoral, college's pastoral setting a campus, thereby introducing that word into the American vocabulary. They had really said it's a campus when we talk about Miami. It's a campus. That didn't come about until Richard talks about Princeton being a campus. Witherspoon managed the college's affairs as president. He preached twice on Sundays. Imagine that twice. Preaching twice. And he had a heavy teaching wasn't it? So the college's faculty of five. They had five on faculty. I mean, think about Miami today. How many people are on faculty in Miami? They start out with that. I mean, we'll learn if you know anything about McGuffey. McGuffey just won him just aim. They had five, three tutors and two professors. He added a professor of mathematics and natural philosophy, and that left him responsible for both providing instruction in moral philosophy, divinity, rhetoric, history, and French. I do enough with just history. Witherspoon introduced English grammar and composition, added the teaching equipment of the college, especially books for the library, laboratory apparatus for science instruction. So he's putting Princeton on the map. If, if you don't. His administration is a turning point in the life of Princeton College. He put fresh emphasis on learning. It starts the movement forward. There's his statue in that garden statues outside the Presbyterian Historical Society. It's down on Dunbar, Longbar, Philadelphia, South Philadelphia, uh, between 4th and 5th. And just a block, two blocks and a half down the south. Uh, Jim's on South Street, because the best cheese moves in town. Nancy's not. She didn't get to have it. I went there twice. I went Sunday and Monday. But when I went back Monday, you guys like, hey, back! Starts out in the Theological Seminary, of course, that is the Theological Seminary at Princeton today for the main buildings. A couple books about 
up the Scots, how they invented the modern world. 